The whole country was out looking for us, for who knew where Kit would strike next. The shooting of that film was the yardstick by which I measure all other film experiences. It was the first film that I worked on that I saw that film could be an art form. They saw cancer. We knew we were at the birth of a very, very special artist in cinema. Hey. You know, the movie is based on the real character, Charles Starkweather. He saw himself as leading a more adventurous, less mundane life than the people that he was coming in contact with. He was executed for the murder of her parents and just everyone that he killed through his crime spree. Well, of course, this case happened in uh, Nebraska in 1958, and he was the first of the infamous uh, serial killer. And I read it that night, and it was, without doubt, the best script that I had ever read. But I had reservations because the character in the script was 19 years old, and I was already 31 at the time. I was cast in the film before Martin. I remember Terry saying, well, you know, this actor is really not right for the role. He's, he's too old. He told me, frankly, that he was looking at a lot of guys, and, and uh, he wanted to see who paired up well with her. And I said, that'd be fine. You know, I guess we'd met with 10 or 15 actors by that time, and we'd been reading the same scenes with them. And Martin came in, and you know, us knowing he was too old, it wasn't gonna work, we were just gonna be really nice. He completely blew us away. Well, wanna take a walk with me? What for? Oh, I got some stuff to say. Guess I'm kinda lucky that way. He came in, he was Kit. He made me blush, he made me giggle. The scene just took on this life. Listen, honey, when all this is over, I'm gonna sit down and buy you a big, thick steak. I don't want steak. Yeah, well, we'll see about that. One night, I got a call uh, saying that uh, he decided to use me, and would I be willing to do it? And I said, why, sure, I'd be happy as Larry. And I had to get up before uh, dawn and I was driving along Pacific Coast Highway, and I was listening to a Dylan song uh, called Desolation Row. Dylan was always my hero all my adult life, and I listened to his music all the time. And suddenly it dawned on me what had just happened, that I had the role of my life. And I began to weep uncontrollably with joy, and I had to pull off the side of the road and just stop and reflect on what was happening and it was one of the most profound moments of my life because it was a realization of a dream that I never thought uh, would happen to me. If I'm worth a damn, I'll pick the right direction. If I'm not, well, I don't care. See what I mean? No. It was a very passionate kind of working experience. Everyone was, no one was making any money and everyone was there because we were just desperate to work on the film. There was a certain excitement that comes in non-union films where everybody's there because they love making films and they're not worried about the clock or how much they're getting paid. But it was so sparing. I mean, you know, there just wasn't any money for anything. I think the budget for the picture was probably around $700,000, but we had a lot of deferments on it. I think it actually got shot for about 350000 It was probably the first film that I really felt creatively engaged in. Terry would ask me questions about the character. Did it go the way it's supposed to? I felt like I wasn't just um, an actor for hire. Well, I feel like a kind of like an animal living out here. There's no place to bathe and not any place to get anything good to eat. Well, I'll catch you a big trout as soon as we get to the mountains. You know, it's the only time in my life that I knew from the very first encounter that I was dealing with a very special man. It was obvious to all of us that had any contact with him that you're working with a genius. Terry is a brilliant man, just a brilliant man and a kind and wonderful man and it was heaven working with him. If he had said, jump off the building and you'll fly, I would have jumped off the building and I know I would have flown. He knows as much about cinematography as the cinematographer. He knows as much about art direction as the art director. A film for Terry's, it's like a, it's like a, 
an erector set. You know, you're, when you're shooting, you're, you're building all the pieces. And the script is his kit. You know, he knows what his kit is. But as, as, as you're shooting, he's, you know, there, there are other little pieces that he finds along the way. I think he loves being on edge, you know, not knowing everything. You know, he, he works hard on the script and he's, he has a plan with the actors and sometimes you just throw things off, like everybody would be prepared to shoot one, one area and he'd move it to another setting. So the actors, anything that they had planned suddenly was like, didn't maybe work in this situation. I remember the, <laughs> the first shot we did, the first scene I shot was uh, out on the prairie, you know, going to visit her father. And I'd washed my hair that morning and I was all shiny and clean shaven and all spruced up and Terry came up and it was the first shot of the movie and he's looking at me and he's thinking oh well Martin uh, well now you know uh, I hope you don't mind if I do this he reached down in the dirt took some dirt in his hands and rubbed my hair rubbed my whole head with the dirt and he said oh, you just look too shiny you all right with that and I said yes sir I am fine he just he just took the shine out of me they would get everything set up for a location and Terry would come out and the weather would be different and He'd go, I want to shoot over there. And he would just go over there with Martin Sheen or Sissy and, and, uh, and the camera and start shooting and it, it disrupted all the plans that the production department had put together and, and sometimes caused chaos. But it allowed Terry to get shots that he couldn't have gotten otherwise. And whenever we would uh, get a scene and he was uh, you know, happy, satisfied that we caught his intention, he would say, all right now, uh, well, y'all do just what you want. Uh, I'm just, just do, uh, you know, just have fun with it here. And a lot of times he used that tape that we just had fun with. And then it began to occur to Sissy and I that he was uh, uh, using that as a method to really get us to relax and be free. If you try and do everything by the book, uh, you're gonna miss some beautiful uh, unforeseen images. We were never able to strike a set on that film. And the film lasted for a long time. It was like 16 weeks. We'd shoot a scene and he'd say, um, hold that set. We, I might want to come back and shoot something else here. Well, at the end of the film, I was like taping leaves on the trees and painting them green because uh, it was autumn. And uh, along the way, some of the lads were getting discouraged and quitting and complaining and whatnot along the way. And I remember very clearly telling people, hey, hang in there. You're going to be real proud of this. We're making a classic, and I used those words. I said classic. Uh, there were some people that were not happy, but the ones that left, uh, I think, will probably regret it today. I just had a feeling. I had a, a certainty. It was more than a feeling. I knew this guy was onto something. I always wanted to be a criminal, I guess, just not this big one. It takes all kinds of. When you're playing. A character, good, bad, or indifferent, you're not really permitted as an actor, as an artist, to make a judgment on the character. Because if you make a judgment, it's a, it's a preconceived notion and the audience sees right through it, you know. Uh, even if you play Hitler, this infamous villain of all villains, uh, you can't make a judgment on him. You've got to be free of judgment in order to play him. Uh, so that you give some understanding, you show some insight into that character. Terry was directing me in a scene and I had to use the weapon, you know. And he said, well, Martin, you know, why that gun is just like a, a magic wand. And someone gets in your way and poof, they're gone. That's it, it's just a, a means to an end. Nothing serious, nothing personal, but you're in my way, sorry about this, poof, you're gone. Now what an image, you know. Get out! The shovel's in the truck! It was very clear from Terry's script uh, that these kids, both Kit and Holly, had an image of themselves that was way out of the realm of reality. They saw the world from their point of view and they projected themselves on it. I mean, Kit fancied himself some kind of important person, you know, who had great business to achieve. Like when he built the monument on the spot where he was captured and made reference to it when they arrested him. Out there is where you called me. He had this image, this absolutely uh, moronic image of himself that had no basis in reality. Now look at here, here's the real prize. Must have had this about 10 years. Look at there. Who's gonna get it? Give me that something. There you go. And suddenly you become 
involved in it, you begin to care about these deeply disturbed kids and this horrible uh, massacre that they're involved in, and yet you never stop caring about them. That's a phenomenal achievement. Oh, uh, we're going to take the Cadillac for a while, how'd that be? Fine. Uh, don't worry, I won't let her drive. I mean, let's face it, he was a very inappropriate boyfriend for her. She was 13 and he was in his early 20s, but I guess could have been those cowboy boots. <laughs> Couldn't have been the garbage route. Well, I know what my daddy's gonna say. What? Can I be honest? Sure. Well, that I shouldn't be seen with anybody that collects garbage. You know, a lot of that was based on, uh, on uh, the real Carol Fugate, who was very helpful to Terry during the making of the movie and very sweet and who we showed the picture to. And she was, she, she was a, a good person. I mean, there's this great line where she's talking to Cato after he's been shot. She goes, is that, that your, your spider, spider in there, there? In that bottle? That bottle? <sighs> I mean, it's just, that's not such a weird line, but the fact that this guy's sitting there, he's been shot, and he's just, he's, he's obviously dying, and she's a little kid asking about spiders in a bottle. You know, I sat, I was feeling kind of blah when you're sitting in the bathtub and all the water's run out. It does evoke feelings of very early childhood, and yet there, she is a participant in horrific, horrific acts of violence. And just by removing herself and that numbness that she has to it all, it's scary. Hi. She wasn't leaving her childhood and suddenly dealing with, with murder and mayhem. She was living this sort of fantasy childhood. And I think that to that extent, the idea came up to build a treehouse, which wasn't in a script but I thought it would be a part of that fantasy is to have a, a house that just sort of went from tree to tree. And, and I told Terry about it and he rescheduled some shooting and gave me a day to build the tree house. And uh, I was a lot younger then and could do more. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was so much fun. And the way Terry shot it and edited it, it made it look even more fantastic than it was. Uh, because I hadn't art directed too many films and this one was so, important to me and exciting. Um, the approach that I take to art direction is, is you know, more like an actor, I, I think. It, I, I mean, I try to complete the character. He practiced, and does still, uh, the Stanislavski uh, method of art direction. I wouldn't stop with just putting the furniture in the, in the room, but I'd want to put their possessions in the uh, furniture so that, uh, when Sissy, as Holly Sargis, was opening drawers, she would find little things that she collected. You thought I was acting in those scenes. I was just, uh, I was just reacting to, to, the, to what was around me. And the things that he left for Holly really made me, helped me understand that she had one foot firmly planted in childhood. Having that kind of passion in doing something together, I think sort of bonded us. That creative process process that we were experiencing at the time was, you know, made for a fertile, romantic situation. And we all knew that uh, a romance was blossoming when one night we were shooting the scene in the Cadillac where we're out in the desert dancing in the headlights of the car. Terry called from off camera, said, uh, uh, well, just have some fun now. Just you guys do whatever you want. And I gave her a little twirl and I kicked her in the backside with my boot, you know, just Kind of a, a, a love thing, but Jack took offense to it and he came into the frame. And we all knew at that point that there was something very serious going on with these two people. And it's lasted 30 years, so God bless them. Yeah, when Sissy and I met, we, I don't think either of us suspected that we would be together 30 years later. That, uh, but when you're working on a film, at least when, on that film, the rest of the world didn't exist. Gosh, I like your house. Uh, I don't know if uh, viewers realize it or not, but Terrence Malick appears in the film in one scene with me. He uh, comes to the door of the rich man's house and talks to Martin. And he played that part because the actor that was supposed to play the part didn't show up. And I love playing it with him. I just love cracking him up because every time I open the door, I'd say, hi, he'd start laughing. 
And uh, he always said to me, he said, no, I'm going to reshoot that scene with another actor from your point of view. Uh, I had to shoot it at that time because we were losing that location. And I said, I will never, ever reshoot that scene again with anyone. And it was the only contentious uh, thing we had between us in 30 years. I, I, I said, I, and he got angry with me. And I remember we coming back to L.A. He was still talking about it. So, well, you know, we got to get out there. We got to, you know, we got to find a way to, you know, reshoot that. I said, not with me. You know, oh, come on now, Martin. We got I said, no, sir. I will never reshoot that scene. No, that's there, you know, forever, as far as I'm concerned. And I'm so glad it is. But he's also in the black and white documentary sequence. We cut to a guy in a trench coat, and he's just pointing at something, and that's Terry. It's wonderful that he's in there. You know, that film uh, lovers today can at least, you can't get him for this interview, but you can see him on film. <laughs> really? In all three of his movies, he'll do cuts to people that you don't have any idea who they are. And it's just to show you that it's a sense of life continuing on. Towards the very end of the movie, uh, Martin and Sissy have been taken away in a plane. The plane hasn't taken off yet, but it has taxied away from where it was on the tarmac. And we cut to a mailman carrying a sack of mail. And the point of that shot was to show you someone that in the midst of this chaos or tragedy, life is going on in other places, and that this guy carrying this sack of mail has no idea that there is this wanted killer on this plane that he's walking past. Terry took the movie to New York before we were finished with it, in a work print form and screened it for the New York Film Festival. It was bought after New York Film Festival uh, by Warner Brothers. And I think they bought it the day they saw it. Uh, and I think they bought Mean Streets on the very same day. Uh, it was a great day for all of us. Vincent Canby's review is astonishing. I mean, he just says, basically clear your head and get to the theater as soon as you have a chance to see this movie. Look out. You know, they, they printed all the reviews and they opened up in uh, Los Angeles, they opened up the Village Theater, which is like a 1,500-seat theater. Now, at that time, Sissy wasn't known, Martin wasn't known, and Terry wasn't known. I had a very distorted <laughs> um, idea of this film's greatness from the, from the get-go, which was, you know, naive on my part. And, you know, when it came out, I remember thinking, oh, my God, it's gonna be a, there's going to be a stampede to the theater. And that did not happen. It was critically acclaimed, but um, it didn't make a lot of money at the box office. But, you know, here we sit 30 years later, so. So I was right, you see. <laughs> and over the years, I think it took about 10 years, and then they were calling it a classic. I think this film uh, is a classic because of, of uh, Terry, you know, because he, he approached it and made the film he wanted to make. It wasn't, uh, he was trying to make a film for a market, or he was trying to make a film that people wanted him to make, but he was able to make the film that he wanted to make. I think that as an artist, if you're able to do your work without compromise, that you have a better chance of it uh, standing the test of time. I learned everything important that I ever learned about the about making movies I learned on that film. It changed uh, my life. I mean, I, I, I approach films differently, you know. I am so deeply and personally indebted to him. Everything I know about editing I learned on Terry's first two movies, uh, Badlands and Days of Heaven. I've worked with, with Terry on all of his films, which is three. <laughs> and uh, Terry, to me, is, is, is sort of maintained his own integrity. He's very humble, you know, he's just, very humble. I mean, he probably thinks that all these brilliant films he's made have been purely accidental. I don't know. But I didn't know Terry was going to wait 20 years between some of his films. Uh, but I think that it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I think if you do 
you know, one great film, it can be wonderful. If people say you only made three films, hey, that ain't bad, you know. I think why, the reason they ask that is because his films are so good, they want more. But, you know, uh, you only get to paint the Sistine Chapel once. I don't know why Terry is so uncomfortable talking about his work, but I think that if you're an artist, uh, your work is interpreted differently by every person who sees it, that they bring something to the work, and that if you talk about your work, you kind of minimize it in a way. He speaks through his work, through his films, and um, I, quite frankly, respect and admire that choice. He's just not interested in a public persona. I don't think there are any interviews of him. Uh, people think of him as like J.D. Salinger, this reclusive uh, monk of a director, which he's nothing like that. So uh, it's just fun for me that people see him like that, and I can kid him about that. And I get lots of phone calls. I have not lots, but I have been called by reporters and wanting to find him or get in touch with him and you say to them well he doesn't like to give interviews and so I can't help you with that and they I've had people get angry with me I mean people have yelled at me over the phone that he has a responsibility to respond to uh, uh, reporters and I have a responsibility to let people know that where he is or how to get in touch with him it's crazy I don't know anyone shyer than Terrence Malley it's a beautiful quality only he knows what's going on inside that head of his. I mean, Terry, today, uh, we're beginning to work on another picture, and, and he keeps saying, I want to do it like Badlands. So he talks about Badlands, and I know he has fond memories of it, and he, he can't remember any of the uh, hardships. But I go, well, aren't we getting too old to be eating bologna sandwiches and <laughs> staying up all night? But he's not. When I was nominated for Thin Red Line, for editing on Thin Red Line, I didn't know what I would say if I were to possibly win it. And, uh, you know, something they'll show photographs of the directors or they'll show a shot of the director in the audience. And Terry wasn't there, so instead of showing, and they didn't have any photographs of him, and he wasn't there, so they showed a shot of his empty director's chair that had his name on it. So, which I immediately thought, oh, of course, I know exactly what I'll say if I win. I would go up and accept the award and say, I'd love to thank Terry Malick, but I've never met him. <laughs>